just about everybody else on electing. Yeah. All right, over here we're going to talk about paying a responsibility for an error. You know, anybody ever make a mistake and try to hide it? Yeah, I I you, try to hide it. you ever try to hide your mistake? What about you, Holmes? Yeah. All right, then. You ever try to hide a mistake? Uh, some later failures are our fault, for some aren't, and we usually don't. Here's a, here's a perfect example. Somebody uh, put a, you know, sometimes I've known stuff so long and I feel like everybody knows it. So somebody put an intake manifold uh, on that Lincoln. Mm -hmm. That he pulled the intake manifold off of it, and somebody, and I'm glad you did because somebody when they pulled up, when they put that new intake manifold on, they didn't even pull, remove the old gaskets. You know, I had them plastic molded gaskets on. And so, and it wasn't running bad or anything. It's totally amazing to me. But whenever we pull it off, I said, what are those doing there? You know, I don't remember who put that on there. But the long and the short of it was we got those gaskets off of there. You know, when you come back and you're working on one, sometimes you'll find something that you missed or messed up on or whatever. You know? All right, so the email I received this way. I got this email. She said, I took my 2006 Honda in for new rotor and brake pads at a national chain service center, not the dealer, and it drove away just fine. I don't usually take it on the freeway because I don't need to on my commute. So last week, when on the freeway, my car would not go over 50 miles an hour. When I pulled over, I got this burning smell. No smoke, just smell. It took it, it took it to the dealer, and there were no error codes, so I went home to the car. So I go, well, you know. So this past Tuesday, the same thing happened, so I took it back. On that visit, the service manager, we went on a test drive, and the car did the same thing for him. So we pulled it aside, and this burning odor filled the car. He said the smell was the brake, so he took it back to the dealership, and they found the brake fluid had been contaminated with what they believed to be engine oil. Somebody had poured the wrong kind of stuff in the master store. All right, and that national chain store was the last shop to do any brake work. So the new rear rotors aren't quite new, nor are the pads. The damage they cause with the oil requires the entire brake system to be rebuilt. All the rubber's welled up. So, a pair of done wrong can be devastating. You don't do it the right way. And these, some of these situations happen because shops have not been properly trained. Service manager of a local GM dealer that he turns down applications all the time of somebody from people, these people come in and say, well, I rebuilt a, a 350 Chevy engine in my backyard and got it started and I'm ready to go to work at the dealership. You know, I mean, that's, he said they didn't really believe that. Now, there's no way to tell what happened in this Honda's case with the consequences of the work out that did. It's a lot of money. All that stuff's got to be replaced, ABS parts and everything. All right, there's no excuse for letting something like this leave your service back. If you're working on somebody's car, you're never supposed to let it out of there like that. Now, if it looks like those things are so rotten that they're going to crumble and all that, you need to be talking to them about, hey, we need to put the battery cable ends on here and all that. Um, there was these, she these sheets that they give you that are kind of like the inspection sheets that we've got. A lot of these dealerships will hand you one of those with every single work order you do. And they say, in addition to all this work you're doing or whatever work you're doing, you know, now we want you to check every one of these items. And I like red, yellow, and green. You know, red means it needs service right now. Yellow means it is going to need service soon. And green means it's just fine. 29 point inspection, whatever. You know, that's all that. And so, um, you know, a lot of people I've seen, I've handed people, uh, I've actually, you know, people I'd be training on doing vehicle inspections. And I would hand them this, um, this sheet. And I would see them standing in front of the car without even looking at the car, just checking off boxes. Is that any good? Well, this one guy was doing that at that dealership over there where I used to work. And they, he had to work on the courtesy lights inside the car or something and every moment of the hood. But he checked off all those boxes on that thing and turned it in. And because he left the courtesy lights on when he got through fixing them, the battery was dead. So they went out there to get the car, and when they opened the hood to jump it off, there was a squirrel nest on top of the battery. Oh, God. And he had checked it. He had checked all the oil and all the belts. And <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He got busted because it was obvious he didn't check it. All right, it'd be the same thing I see it is. If you do a 29 point inspection and it, and it looks like this when you're done, that's dreadful. Here's something else. If you see this one looking really good and that one's covered up with this fancy red cover, pull the red cover back because you'll see that garbage. A lot of the time you'll see it. Or you'll see it starting to grow some of that stuff. So that stuff needs to be got off of there. And the top of the battery needs to be perfectly clean too because if the top of the battery is not clean, surface drain can actually eventually go. I saw a Thunderbird one time came in with on the hook with a dead battery, 
and there was a pile of fire ants all the way across that darn thing. I never got there. They about four inch thick. All right, so you shouldn't have any of these left over when you're putting it back together either. <laughs> Anybody had any of these left when you put it back together? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody leave the bag full of bolts in the car so the customer would find them? Do you? Do what? Yeah, that was me. I will tell you though, this is really something. When you're pulling a dash off of a car, it's not for the faint hearted. I mean, you've got to really work to get all that stuff out. One time I had to pull the instrument cluster out of a 90 model Ford probe, and I was counting the screws I had to do to get that darn thing out of there. I had to pull out, I said, 33 screws. I mean, I had 33 screws in a little magnet tray when I got that thing pulled off and it, you know, looked just like that. All right, so this says, my car developed a gas smell after you installed the implement. What do you see there? Oh. They drilled, they, drilled they ran the that screw through there and went right into the gas tank. Yeah. Brilliant. Really Outstanding performance. You got nothing there. All right, so unnecessary parts change. The technician missed something that should have been obvious and it sold an O2 sensor the customer didn't need. PC valve, not hooked up. Yeah, actually that's the PCB closure. This air that's coming through here is metered air, and the, this PCB system pulls air out of that clean stream, but it's got, the reason it does it is because it's got to be metered, so it's got to, the system's got to know. You can put the wrong PCB valve on a car and throw the fuel trim out of balance. Did you know that? That's what you do right there. You pull that off, mm -hmm. place more fuel in the car so you have more horsepower. <laughs> All right. Now, when they pop the hubcap off and they find this after you put the wheels back on. No, God. See, Harry, you ever see this before? How'd they even tighten it down? Huh? How'd they even tighten it down? They figured out a way. I found that and took that picture. Somebody had put that wheel back on. I popped the hubcap off and I said, Who the heck did this? And, uh, Somebody who shall remain nameless, I saw the other day, screwed all the lug nuts off, and when they put them back on, they were putting them back on backwards. Good. All right. So, Who was it? Uh, you don't need to know. <laughs> all right. So well, they find this after you replace the fuel pump in the vehicle foot again. I've seen that. This ha that happened here too. Uh, Pontiac Montana comes in, fuel pump won't run. We get our test light, hook it to the hot side, go into the fuel pump terminal. There's no ground back there. Boom, we kick it under there, it comes on, it's got to be the fuel pump. Pull the gas tank, there's already a brand new fuel pump in there. Oh man, that's bad, that bad news. So we send that new fuel pump back that we ordered, and I get to looking, and this connector is right, in, right above the wheel well, and it throws all kind of salt splash up in there, and it chalks up in terminals. If you see chalky terminals like that, then you don't need to look any farther before you fix that nonsense. And sometimes you got to get pigtails and stuff to make it happen. Uh, Charles will probably just, you know, tie them together and tape them. <laughs> Somebody finds this and you were the last person to do the oil change. Hey, you strip it out or put it back in the i tell you what happened to this one actually. In reality, what happened to this one was, well, it was similar to this one. That may not be the same one, but there it is. And so uh, I had this boy working here, and he was really a... Seemed like he's a pretty intelligent student, but one of the things he always had trouble with was righty tighty and lefty loosey. Tyler? One Tyler. Tyler, he does it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, the long and the short of it is, I was says, change all this Crown Victoria. So he gets over, he gets started. Well, he'd done all changes before. And I go over here, and I notice that he's got a cheater pipe, and that he's done with it. But he still ain't got the drain plug out. And I go over here, and he's turning the drain plug around and around the tightening way. And it's just going around and around. And I said, what are you doing? Don't you know that goes the other way to come out of there? Oh, okay. So he turns it the other way. And by some miracle, angels and ministers of grace defend us, this thing came out of there. I couldn't believe it came out, but it cost me where you wipe the threads out. You know, now what happens if you're screwing that, uh, if you're screwing that in there and you wipe out those threads? Isn't that something? He did that with a cheater for him. And that one, that one is not. But I will tell you this: all drain plugs, when they start to get to where they're, if you take, if you break it loose, and it comes a little ways where you're in, then you got to take it out with a wrench. It needs to be replaced. That plug needs to be replaced. And in extreme circumstances, on some of the aluminum oil pans, we've actually had to put thread inserts in there because they be messed up. But I will tell you this: a lot of people will take and they'll put a, a, a self-tapping oil plug in there, but they, they didn't even need to. Got me. So uh, always replace it with the right size oil drain plug. Because usually it'll just screw right back in over your fingers and tighten it just fine. The oil drain plug's softer than that nut in the pan. 
All right, so I worked at a dealership for 15 years under this really sharp dealer principal. The guy that was running that place was sharp. He was honest. All he ever wanted to know when somebody came back complaining was, I want to know what the truth is. And when I find out what the truth is, we'll make it right. That's all he wanted to know. He never tried to duck out of anything and all that. So, and so the service manager at that shop, on the other hand, came and went. We'd have different service managers. And this guy that we had at that, that this particular time, he was a kind of a shyster. He was always trying to stir up the puppies, you know. A funny story about him. We had a recall where we had to replace the catalytic converters on a lot of these vehicles. And the, whenever we took the whole exhaust system off the catalytic converters on there, what we were supposed to do was get a abrasive saw and cut the catalytic converter out of the pipe, put them in a burlap bag and send them back to Ford because they didn't want you loading up a pickup load of catalytic converters and getting $75 a piece from them in salvage yard. So they made you send them back to them. Right? Anyway, so every time there were so many of them recalls going on, this exhaust system went all over Ford everywhere. You know? And so he'd go by there, hey, cut up this exhaust from here, you know. And so they cut the catalytic out of it, put them in a bag, and take them apart, and throw the rest of the stuff in and scrap iron beer. And uh, so he was always, you know, going around getting stuff, you know, hey, do this, take care of that for me, and all that kind of stuff. And then one day, this guy was, had put his transmission back in his uh, Crown Victoria police car, and he got looking for an exhaust system, and the service manager had had somebody cut it up. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with that one, so he had to get another, you know, thousand dollar worth of exhaust to put on the car. But anyway, so I called out and I looked at this Crown Victoria that had been repaired a year earlier by one of our line technicians. We had 25 techs in there. And that's what that module looks like on that Ford uh, back then, stick film ignition module, right? So it had failed, and the shop that replaced it showed the owner the module had been broken during a previous repair and subsequently had failed because of that damage. Not uncommon for somebody to prowl on that darn thing when they're trying to set the timing. You prowl on that plastic thing when you're trying to set the timing because it looks like this is a natural thing you want to prowl on, and it tears it apart, it starts to break it, and that's what happened on this one. But it ran for about a year before it quit. And then when the shop pulled it off and said, hey, somebody broke this. So he brings it back. All right, so the service manager, he even tried to tap down out of situations like this. So I, the, the dealer principal, you know, had me called up there to the front, stand in front of the dealership and said, hey, I want you to, I want you to investigate this. Whenever they had mad customers, they'd call me up there and talk to them for some reason. I don't know if they're not even running my job, you know. But I, I could either get them calling down. Anyway, I went up there, pulled a file folder, Saw the guy's name that did it, and I said, yeah, we broke it. I mean, I know this guy, I know what he did. He put it in and take a manifold gasket on it, had the distributor out, put it back in, and I know, I guarantee he pried on the other thing and broke it. Because that's the kind of work that I did we do. So, the dealer gave the guy the man's money, like $100, and that's why the shop should do. If you broke it, you ought to give it back. Now, some shops, they make you pay for your mistakes, so be really careful when you make mistakes. Uh, and all that. Adam Snap, whenever he was working, at any shop he was working at, he worked at a whole bunch of shops. If he if he broke something, he always took money out of his wallet and he paid for it. They didn't ask him for it a lot of times, but he just paid for it because he wanted to try to make it right. All right. So I knew a guy back in the nineties that did all the diesel pickup work. He was in that same place, and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but when a diesel is switched off, you ever notice that? You go, oh, oh, oh. it stops real fast like that because it's got high compression. He screwed the fan on, you know, how it screws on there, but he forgot to tighten it. And it came off and went through the radiator. So he heard that happen. He knew the fan was coming off and destroyed the radiator it was his fault. But he thought he could do a pull a fast one. So he went to the file cabinet, the same one I went to to pull that file out of the other car. Pulled that pick up, found his work order, saw where he had written on the repair order, he'd take the fan off and reinstall it, and he tried to mark it out. So when they went and pulled it, they wouldn't realize that it was his fault. He was wanting to hear really clear, you know. So the best thing to do is take responsibility for the screw up and come clean. You know, say, hey, I screwed up. I, I did some fairly extensive wiring work on a new Lincoln. He wanted a six disc changer put on that thing and then pull all this had to pull all the big connectors come off the back of the sound system, he had to pull some pins out and put them in there and all that kind of stuff. And had to pull the uh, back seat out and everything. Well I was taking the upper part of the back seat out, something happened, somebody bumped me or whatever when I was taking it out of the car and the, the uh the things on the back seat, right behind the, the, the back window, went against the back of the car. <laughs> made a really nasty, ugly scratch on it. So I went and got, I was, yeah, I was supposed to be sick when I do something. So I went and got the fixed operations manager, Ronnie, and showed him what happened. He said, hey, I scratched you, I'm going to pull that out. He said, uh, 
So he showed the gal what happened, and the banker said, I ain't worried about it. I just take it like it is. I was like, I can't live without it. Bring it back, let y'all fix it. Wasn't a big deal. You didn't really care. There was another car I was driving. It was cutting off at night. I mean, they, in the morning it wouldn't start. Shiny black escort. And so the service manager said, drive this thing home and um, see if you can get it back up tomorrow morning and find out what's wrong with it. Because we won't ever do it while we got it here. And she said it does it just about every morning. So I drove it home, and when I pulled up to my mailbox, I wasn't used to driving that daggone car. You know, whenever you're going home, you feel like you're doing everything the same way you always do it. I pulled up there, and I ran the mirror against the mailbox. When I was reaching out mail, I like, eh, made a big scratch on it. So uh, I said, um, and, they, and the service manager said, what did you find out on that escort? I said, well, not much, but I sure scratched the crap out of that mirror on the mailbox. <laughs> and he goes, oh, no, that's all we need. So we took it to the body shop around there, and they fixed it, you know, just like it was brand new. Of course, the body shop does it. So anyway, it's a Toyota Camry. One of my students had done some cylinder head work about a year previously, not a year ago. The cylinder head was removed and a valve job was done. Now these Toyota Camrys on engine repair, um, didn't I run through this thing on y'all about how you could replace the valve stem seals on a, a Toyota Camry if you know how to do it without pulling the head off? You know how much it costs on one of these Toyota Camrys like that one right there? The labor time on pulling the head off and putting it back on is 17 hours. So at most dealerships, by the time you buy your gaskets and all this, is a two thousand dollar repair to pull the cylinder head all the way back on. But I figured out a way to do it without. Yeah. But anyway, we went up and pulled the head off this one for whatever reason. So, How do you do it? Huh? How do you do it? I've got a little tool I designed, so I pull the camshafts out of it, and you can actually. And I got a I got a PowerPoint I'll run through because we're doing engine repair anyway. I mean, showing you how I did it, and uh, I figured out a way to do it whenever on these Camrys because having a, they usually pull the head off, send it to the shop to get a valve job done, but you don't have to do that if you just place the seal on it. And the valve stem seals, when they're leaking, you know what the symptoms are when valve stem seals are leaking? Smoke out when you crank it. Huh? Smoke out when you crank it. Yep. And also it'll smoke at island sometimes. And also it'll have this puffy brown stuff that looks like ice cream on a spark plug. If you see that, when you pull the plug out, like it's built up a lot of puffy brown stuff, that's valve stem seals leaking. Long and short of it is, Alan Cobb's uh, little red 93 camera, he was puffing smoke out and throwing the whole parking lot up, and we put valve stem seals on that one. Fixed it, because I, mean, I had a tool I built. I can show it to you. He used a C clamp and a plate. And, some stuff and made it where we could push them things down and get the keepers off. And <coughs> yeah, we got that fixed. All right, so it suddenly developed an aggressive oil leak, and we found out it was coming from the passenger rear corner of the head gasket. Now, these vehicles that have overhead cams, these overhead cam engines have got a pressurized oil feed through the head gasket up there. They got to oil the cam, right? You got that? All right, so we found this prodigious leak coming from the rear. And Burke pulled the valve cover off, the timing chain tensioner, and both cam jets would check the cylinder head bolt on the left rear corner and found it would not tighten. Stripped out. Round and round and round. All right, so the bolts had been replaced the previous year when we done the head work because they're torque to yield bolts. You know what a torque to yield bolt is? Torque to bolt No, torque to yield bolt means you go to a certain foot poundage and then you go another 90 degrees and then you go another 90 degrees. It stretches. Typically, you have that when you got an aluminum head going to a cast iron block. That's usually how it'll work. Although sometimes, even going through with cast iron heads, you'll have torque yield bolts, like on this uh, Taurus engine. Somebody's going to build a short block uh, Taurus, I mean, three liter engine next semester, the people that are still here. Um, anyway, the oil leak was a direct result of that failure. And yeah, because the pressurized oil feed to the camshaft barrels of the VVG solenoid passes right through the head gasket, right next to that bolt. And the only threads that could have failed were the aluminum ones in the engine block. So we're removing and reinstalling the head is about a 17 hour labor charge. And once you've done a couple of them, you can beat the heck out of that time. That's pretty cool there. All right, so there's the little thing right there. The uh, cylinder head is like $900 and replace the cylinder head 17.2. All right, so an hour later, Burke had the head off. And this is what we found. You see that little thing? It looks like a spring he's holding his head. Those are the threads that came out of the block. Now, why would they do that? I mean, I, he used the torque wrench, and he did like he's supposed to do. Why would they come out there like that? This is very, very, very important, and y'all need to remember this. When you've got head bolts you're putting on, if there's liquid in the bottom of that hole, it ain't got nowhere to go. So before you put your head back on there, you know, getting all jumping ahead of yourself and all that kind of stuff, what you need to do is take your air blower and your rag and you blow out every darn hole. 
to make sure there's no coolant, no oil, no nothing in the bottom of that hole. On this one here, there had to have been some liquid standing in the hole when he torqued the head bolt, but it seemed like it torqued down okay, and it held okay until those threads that he sort of started shearing off finally came off, and there's those threads. Don't usually see a pretty little set of threads that come out like that. Uh, but anyway, that uh, we use a blower and blow that stuff out of there, and that's always real. The first time I ran into that was uh, in 1974 when I was rebuilding a 440 Chrysler engine in a black Chrysler, and it was a four door and it had power windows and the steering wheels on the driver's side, and so I was putting that thing back together, and I was trying to tighten one of the head bolts. And I said, this, I know this is my head bolt, but it won't tighten up. It's still got about that much space. And Ed, the guy that ran the gas station, said, Oh, come on, you got water coming down there. So we screwed it out of there, and he. Blew all that mess out of there and it went all the way tied up. Eddie's guys down at the bottom of the hill, they had that happen on a diesel, big old diesel motor. And they said, they're going to go ahead and just tighten that thing and we're going to get this thing tightened or no, why not? So they got a big cheater pipe and they kept working on it until they busted the block on that diesel. With that hydraulics, that stuff ain't going to press. All right? So as the clamping force was applied to the gasket, the hydraulic lock of the fluid against the tip of the bolt started, especially when it got hotter. Started, there were all these tons of pressure, and the weakest threads were the ones in the box. They started to shear, but that's all they did to start with. And the clamping force was sufficient to contain oil pressure for a long time, but it eventually gave way. This was something that we did. Now, uh, when I published this in, in Motor Age Magazine, there was some guy that kept emailing me saying, oh, you're going to have to guarantee everything you do forever. You, you know, this guy right here got was, he drove far enough to where you shouldn't have had to fix that, because it was like a year later, you know. I said, well, I knew that we did it, so we just went and fixed it. This is the only head bolt on the engine where a failure occurred, and if this sudden failure had happened on a long trip, the engine would have welded its rotating components together because it would leak an oil pretty bad, and before the driver even knew the wall was being lost. So now we had to salvage it. So, special helicoil hits just for a job like this. Helicoil larger than the hole. Normal hole, you have to strip thread, and say, hey, drill it out, and then you put that little thread insert back in there. Stainless steel makes it stronger. They have special helical sets that's four head bolts, too. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, what we wound up doing. Travel several inches through the block before the bolt reaches the head. It's a pretty good size head bolt. We had to use a 5 8 drill. I mean, a drill with a 5 8 bit to drill that thing down out to the right size to put that, head, put that thing in there. And that was a monster job, but we got it done. So, 11 millimeter head bolt passing through a 12 millimeter hole. <coughs> The helical was larger than the upper part of the hole, so the hole had to be enlarged. So how much could we save? You know, so we didn't want to make sure we were too big and made it weak where it didn't need to be. So ordered the helicoils, used a 5 8 drill bit, had to drill out the remaining threads, you know. And so the first helicoil didn't hold the torque, and we did it again, got it out of the hole, tapped them deeper, and the next one held, and he put it back in. So we got that one done and got it back out on the road again. And I, I need to show you all that little procedure for doing those valve cover gas, I mean valve stem seals on that thing. And the, the kit, I mean the little tool that I made for that. Is right here. I did some uh, Charles Hudson work here. See this right here is gonna push the, the valve you know, spring. Right? And this right here, I've got it on here loose where it'll I can bolt it down just anywhere I want to with one of the holes. And then you turn it down, you put it in here, when you turn it down, it's pushing the valve spring down. And you get the little keepers out. And now you've got to have air pressure in the uh, cylinder so it's holding the valves closed. Because if you just take the valve keepers off, the valve falls down in the cylinder, then, you know, that's not fun. So anyway, uh, that little red spark thing. Plug out. Huh? Take the spark plug out and put air in Yep, put air pressure running the hole. Toy TOY165, this is an AST tool, that little thing right there. I got that off a Mac tool truck. And uh, it's made to make for the valve springs on Camrys and stuff. And that's what it is. The little valves on a Camry look like dead gum lawnmower valves. They ain't bigger than nothing. You know, but, but anyway, but we fit, we put valve stem seals on several of them using these same homemade tools. And I've got a patent on it. And so uh, the last year my patent on this tool generated $1.6 million, but uh, I gave it to charity. Not really. Actually, I ain't got no patent on this tool. I just made it out of an old C-clip. Alright. Anybody, anybody got any questions? Is everybody bored to death? You should patent that for real. Try to. Huh? Maybe try to patent that for real. Yeah, well, I'm sure somebody will come up with something better. All you gotta do 
I made one one time, a, a tool to uh, to do the uh, turn off the injectors on a power stroke diesel. I, I got six tunnel switches and I got the little valve cover, uh, you know, some uh, valve cover's got the wire harness going through it. I got the valve cover part and I, you know, made it where you could basically just unplug each set of injectors at the same time and you could turn these switches off and on and turn the injectors off and on so we could tell which one of the power strokes were skipping because sometimes it's hard to tell. If you know what you're looking at on your scan tool screen, you can turn them off and back on to tell which one's which. But anyway, I sent a thing off to Hickok and I said, hey, why don't you make one of these for turning the injectors off and on? They says, no, we won't be interested in that. And so about a year later, they came out with one. <laughs> it was better than mine though because they had improved it where you just had to plug it into a big block connector and it was all going to be where But it went that they had a procedure for using that to tell. You know, what we do. I don't know if they got that idea from me or if they already had it in production, but I built one before they did, so that was kudos, you know. Anyway.